the Steminism Equity in STEM podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Steminism, the Equity in STEM podcast. Leveling the playing field in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. My name is Clive Sower. And I am Ali Saad. And collectively, we are... Banta STEM. Excellent. So today we're here to talk about our values, which are modeled on the word STEM. Uh, we're only going to manage to touch on two of those today. Um, so the topics today that we're going to consider are the self and technical excellence. That's right. And um, I know you've probably started the video and think, oh, corporate values. Well, it was not how I wanted to spend my evening or morning or afternoon. And just to give a bit of context, when we started Van to STEM in 2020, we wanted to put together a set of values that not only guided our beliefs and that had helped us along our journey um, through, through our career development, but would also help the people that we're working with as well. So we see our values a bit of a, a mirror in terms of our direction, but also hopefully bringing direction to those that we're, we're working with as well. So without further ado, uh, we'll start talking about self. Um, and so we've, when we thought about self and how we wanted to present it or, or capture it, what came to mind was uh, a sunflower and we called it the selfie, uh, selfie flower, as it were. And so that's right. In the middle, you have the, the self. So that's where all the lovely seeds are. And then each petal represents a different part of your kind of self-armory. So self-control, self-awareness, self-development, self-belief, self-love. We're, go we're going to talk about all these concepts uh, in a bit more detail. So we'll maybe do you want to start talking about self-control and your thoughts? Sure, yeah, absolutely. I think self-control is honestly um, one of the first foundations of the self. Um, a lot of people that we speak to generally struggle. They say that they're feeling overwhelmed or... Um, you know, it's all generally speaking, getting out of hand. Um, so self-control is, is a really a good way to, to bring yourself back in line, um, and a good way to set yourself up for success. So self-control, what does it mean to me? I guess, uh, it's a practice. It's an ongoing thing. It's not something that you figure out overnight. Um, it requires feedback. It requires experimentation and it requires patience. Um, I think that self-control is uh, a good basis for things like uh, having self-awareness and also being self-motivated because if you feel like everything's getting out of hand, you're just not going to have the discipline really to um, bring yourself back into that central place. How do I practice self-control? Um, I try and meditate. And exercise, to be honest, that's a good way to just generally let, let things move through. Um, I have a practice of um, uh, sort of like a scheduling practice um, to make sure that I'm on top of all of my different tasks, whatever they may be. Doesn't always work, but I mean, we are humans, we're fallible. And that's another reason why self-control is a practice. Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it there. Is there anything that you want to add to um, to the principle of self-control? Yeah, I think you you touched on some really key points there. And what I'd like to add to that is this world is chaotic. It's crazy. There's a lot of things that are out of your control. You don't decide what family you're born into, where you where you may live or where you're born. There's a lot of climate, weather. One of the things that you are actually in control of, full mm. control, is yourself. So once you take ownership of that and you're aware of that, that's where the, the power begins mm. and you stop focusing on all the things that are out of your control, blaming other people, blaming other situations and just having that accountability. So I think that's a, a great foundation. Uh, you touched on self-awareness as well. Yeah, maybe we should move a, into that next. a really next. important one as well. And I think it's... In terms of your situations, your circumstances, what you're trying to achieve, if you're not aware of where you are, it's very hard to figure out where you're trying to go. So self-awareness is, is key in, 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 in planting yourself in, in understanding and, and also evaluating where you want to go. So I think that, that part of the awareness is, is really key. 
um, what your thoughts? I also think that, you know, you don't know what you're giving out. You don't know what you're expressing. You don't know what energy you're putting out there and what people are receiving if you're not self-aware. So if you're sort of moving, uh, for want of a better word, blind, um, you know, people might be forming opinions about you or might be um, generally interpreting um, your, your outlook and your vibe in general. Um, so I think that having self-awareness really brings that control back to you. And, 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 and it means that you are able to market yourself, to establish your brand, to, um, to navigate usually environments that, that are, so, I mean, some, some environments might seem very comfortable, some environments might seem very alien. Um, the, if you get that control uh, and, you, and you are able to be self-aware, I think any environment becomes comfortable. Yeah, yeah. And just to give an example of that, I'm going to mm-hmm. rewind back to, to our uni days. Uh, we might throw a picture up there just, just to reference it. I think I was very aware that I didn't like taking notes and I felt like I wasn't good at it either. And this was clearly a gap. I think it was something that I realized in my bachelor's degree and going into my master's degree, um, big up Kingston University where, where, where we met. And I, one of the things I was looking to do was tap into other people's strengths. And so I became self-aware that I'm not good at writing notes, don't like writing notes. How can I improve on this? And the best way to just learn from someone who was really good at it. Conveniently, that was me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So yeah. it, was, it was a match made in, in the lab um, where it got to the point, I wouldn't even bother making notes now. I'd just come to you and photocopy yours. And for me, that was a, a better trade-off of time. I now understood what good notes looked like. So now when I'm making notes, I'm still referencing some of the styles that I learned from, from you back then. And so... That's where the, the self-awareness is key. But if I decided actually, forget it, I'm not going to look at whether I'm a good note taker or not. I'm just going to deal with it as is. Um, I'd still be making terrible notes. And and no matter how far you, you get in life, good notes always, always add value. So I think that's a, a great example. Uh, I'm honoured. I just want to say, I am honoured. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 all about knowing how to how to play into your skills, and 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 awareness is is sort of the starting point for that. Um, maybe we move into self motivation next. So it is something that I think I struggled with in the past, um, particularly early in my career. I felt like I had this huge mountain that I needed to climb over and there was just tiny little me. I didn't even have the right equipment and it was really cold at the top. So I really struggled with self-motivation because I I usually felt like the task was huge. Um, Is that something that you've experienced? And if so, how do you feel like you navigated um, that climate? Yeah, that's, that's that's a really good point. And I think as you said... As you go through this journey in life, despite the the amazing people you may have around you, there's going to come a time where you need to dust off your boots and and, and talk yourself in, in, into belief, as it were. And so what I found really helpful, um, especially when I go back to my, my earlier days, was listening to, to some of these motivational speakers. Mm. And for me, there's one particular one that comes to mind that... I could relate to, um, and that was from Eric Thomas. And pretty, maybe you may not you may not know him, but if we'll we'll, we'll tag the clip in here, his clip went viral um, almost ten years ago, and his story was about the guru who was teaching a student that if you want success, you've got to want it to the point that you you can't breathe anymore. Oh wow! And and it sounds deep, but what I learned from that was actually by listening to motivational things whilst I'm doing my assignments or if I'm working in the gym, kind of shifted away from listening to music to now trying to inspire and motivate myself. And these things would now come into play in my subconscious. So when times are tough, when I'm trying to achieve a goal, um, I'd hear Eric Thomas in the back of my head. Mm -hmm. And that was always a, a major inspiration. So maybe it came from someone else. But I was able to internalize it and tap into it when I when I really needed it when um, when when times were tough. So finding um, 
different speakers. Denzel Washington's another great one. He he's given a couple of commencement speeches, and one of his that always stays with me is each one teach one. And so, if you want to become really good at a skill, if you get good enough at it to be able to teach it. That's a great way. And so that's something that I always use to motivate and inspire myself, um, tapping into the wisdom of, of other people before. Yeah, I really like that. I think what I heard a lot of, um, or I mean, I guess how, how I interpreted that was, there's a lot of motivational quotes out there. There's a lot of, especially nowadays, there's so much media available. It could be overwhelming almost, but it's about finding uh, the people that you can relate with uh, and sometimes that message just hits home. That you could have two people saying the exact same thing, but because you respect and uh, uh, you know sort of admire one of those, you're much more likely to hear it from them. So, yeah, I, I think it is important to um, look for people whose morals, values, um, ethics, um, generally their output are a reflection of yourself. And I think, um, yeah, that's probably a good way to stay motivated. Um, I also like to break things down into sort of bite-sized chunks and trying to visualize just, let's say, maybe going back to the mountain metaphor, instead of it just being a huge mountain, it's just loads of really tiny hills. <laughs> I love that. Every time you get to the peak of your little hill, you're like, yes, success. I've made it onto the next hill. And I actually used this um, this principle when I was out hiking uh, in Nicaragua, funnily enough, with some friends. And they're both really, really tall and take really long strides, but they were the only ones complaining. <laughs> and I think the issue there was the self-motivation, the mental management. Great point. Great point. And yeah, I've done some, some hiking. I was in the Simeon Mountains and I remember after day one, when the altitude hitness hit... Mm. You can't think about the peak or the top mm. of the mountain. If you start thinking about that, you overthink, you overwhelm, self-doubt sets in, all of these different things. Whereas what they what they told us, I wish I remember that. I think it was mole mole, but literally mm. step by step. If mm. you focus on putting one foot in front of the other, not only number one is it very simple and easy to do, but it's that repetitiveness, it's that consistency that you 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 learn to build up. And, and those things are, are really, really important. And I think that ties into the next one as well in terms of self-belief and all of these different parts of self that we've spoken about before are, are crucial to, to believing in yourself because, number one, if you don't believe it, you can't convince anyone else um, to believe it either. So if you're, if you're looking to be the best analytical scientist in the field, but when you're looking in the mirror, you're thinking, actually, I can't do this. How are you going to convince the people in an interview? How are you going to convince the professional bodies that you are the the best in class? And there's there many you often hear fake it before you uh, fake it until you make it, but sometimes that doesn't actually give it enough credit. You have to believe it before you can achieve it, and sometimes that's six months, a year of seeing no results, but demonstrating that consistent behavior, repeating what you've learned. And it's not easy. So my self-belief often comes from seeing others that have been there and done it and realizing that, yeah, that human being is just like you are. Um, here are the steps they did. Here are the challenges. Um, and finding out that actually you can do it. And a lot of the times you have that self-belief when things are going well. You, you smash a, an exam, you get a new job. Self-belief is, is high. But when things are getting difficult and things are tough, that's when your, your self-belief diminishes and that's when you really need those reserves and those foundations of knowing that actually there will be tough times. And so before I go off on a tangent, that's why this, this social media, what would I call it? This social era that we're living in, um, there's pros and cons to it. You can easily get soaked up and, and drown in it by focusing on what everyone is presenting as a highlight. Um, people don't show their losses. People don't show their, their challenges, their, their downtimes. And those are actually what build character. So I think, yeah, that's why self-belief is, is really key. That was beautiful. You've made <laughs> so many things came to my mind. I was just like, I don't even know where to start. Um, imposter syndrome is, the, is one of the things that I thought of when you were talking. Um, that's sort of the opposite of self-belief, like always feeling like you're not supposed to be there. And 
<laughs> syndrome makes it sound like, you know, it's something if you're unfortunate, you might run into it where, whereas actually in practice, I'm pretty sure everyone experiences at least a small degree of imposter syndrome. Imagine you've just, you know, you've been working as, um, I don't know, a technical sales manager for the last 10 years, and then suddenly you're approached about being the CEO. You've never done that before. It's a huge role. You've got so much responsibility on your shoulders. Everyone is expecting you to succeed, and your goal is to pay your shareholders. So they are not going to be as forgiving as, you know, someone else um, when you were in a more junior role. So I, I think there is an aspect of quote unquote faking it until you make it. But you are right that at the core of that is a strong sense of, I can do this. And even if it's just something you say to yourself and don't fully believe yet, if you are able to keep repeating that mantra, eventually it's going to become part of your narrative. Um, so that was one of the things that I was thinking. Um, uh, another thing that I was thinking was um, your inspirations. So I, I'm I'm very fortunate. M my dad has instilled in not just me, my also my brother and my sister, the most strong sense of self belief. Not only because of the way that he carried himself, but also because of the way that he communicated the the story he told himself, the narrative that he told himself, and that's honestly quite a lot of self-belief. It's the narrative that you tell yourself. Um, so not everyone is, is fortunate enough to be in that position. And it's just the reality of the situation. How can you find those same uh, drivers, let's say? And I guess what I've heard people doing um, is, is looking to role models and looking to role models that they can aspire to and seeing a little bit of themselves in that person and using that as the anchor, let's say, to propel that sense of self-belief. Um, I think it's quite a powerful tool. Um, and yeah, honestly, if you just believe that everyone is trying, no one has actually got it, like lockdown, they're a pro, which is the truth, then, you know, you can, you can see a little bit of yourself in everyone. And, and, and that should give you, I guess, the, um, the, the, uh, the drive to to unlock that sense of self belief. Great, so many great points in there, and I think just adding to that as well, all of these things are kind of futile if you if you don't have that accountability of self. Mm. And so it's great having the awareness, it's great having the development, and great having the esteem. But if you don't hold yourself accountable, and I think it works both ways. When we think about accountability, it's okay. I'm saying I'm going to do ABC, so I'm going to be, I'm going to do ABC. But on the flip side, I think is if you're only able to achieve A and B, it's looking back and realizing, okay, maybe it wasn't A, B and C, but that's still 66.6% .6 of what I aim to achieve. It's almost maybe the first. <laughs> exactly. It is, it is, yeah, we won't go back to first and seconds and, and third class degrees. Um, uh, <laughs> but anyway... Um, Back to the point, yeah, I think it's important to, to understand that accountability process because once you are able to hold yourself accountable, both negatively and positively, mm -hmm. that's, how you, that's how you move forward and that's how you demonstrate a lot of these, these self-characteristics. So where does accountability come from? I think setting goals, setting mm -hmm. SMART goals. Um, look at the, the acronyms that we'll probably log, log up here. Um, lovely <laughs> and and looking at these goals reviewing them because i think one one expression that i've heard is that a dream is is just a wish until you put action behind it and so it's that action if you if you don't make the actions feasible you spoke about breaking down the steps that is so important if your aim is to be the ceo of a tech startup that's a huge goal mm -hmm to achieve and once you it's hard also very hard to track as well how do you know you're you're getting closer or further away what is key is breaking it down so if you're at the beginning of your career maybe the goal is to be a tech ceo startup expert but to do that maybe you need to learn from someone that's done it before so you want to become an intern in one of the fortune 500 um companies that has already done it and then when you get on that path feel okay that's a baby step and I'm on that journey. So I think it's having that perspective, having that understanding and, and being realistic as well. 
you may not achieve all your goals in all the time frames that you set. But if you're heading towards the direction that you've initially set out, what is your guiding star? That will that will get you on the path. Yeah, I like that. And I think also, like, you don't have to carry all of those balls. It it sounds like uh, a quite heavy task, for example, but just giving the example that you just gave. When you're trying to rise up through the ranks, you're going to have managers, you're going to have peers. You know, you need to use your network really in a way which is beneficial to your collective progression. And that's really part of the point of working for a company as well. It's not just to go there, do some work for them, get some money and leave. You're trying to upskill, you're trying to network. So I think that um, leaning on your peers, particularly your manager, who hopefully should have some skin in the game when it comes to um, their um, their like their employees' progression. Ask them, ask them for some support. Um, ask them to help you have that accountability. And I think through that process, you will learn how to be accountable yourself. And I think that also a uh, part of that is discipline. A uh, part of that is practice. Um, it's sort of um, twofold. Um, and yeah, I guess all of these concepts really tie in together to what I think is probably the most important petal in the selfie flower, which is self-love. And I know a lot of people have a problem with self-love. It's probably one of the reasons for the mental health crisis that we're seeing, seeing today. And that might be because they were negatively reinforced by messages in their past going growing up. Um, they never had uh, an avenue to express um, you know, those parts of themselves that would allow them to um, recognize why they were valuable, why they were loved. But I think that um, if you have all of those initial um, points that we touched on, the self-control, the self-awareness, the self-belief, the self-accountability, then you will inevitably feel love for yourself. And I think if you can, uh, if you, if you can align with your self-love, there's nothing else that you, that, there's nothing that can knock you down. You know, you can be rejected. You can, it, it, it's like, a, um, it's something that gives you resilience as well as just, oh, I, I love myself. And the, the thing is to not be, not to have ego. Um, it's to just resonate, I guess, you know, to, 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 to really unlock your potential. And I think that that, the language for that is love. Deep, deep, deep. How do I, how do I even <laughs> add to that? I think the only the only thing I'll add to that is, especially in terms of self love, is that sometimes it's painted as this perfect. I uh, I love myself when I'm perfect, when everything is rosy, when I've got the house, the mansion, the car, the kids, all the all the wonderful things. When actually I think it's more about loving the journey that you're in, where you are now. Um, accepting what's happened in the past. Um, we spoke about control. You can't control what's happened in the past. What you do have control over is what will happen in the future. And that's narrated or, or defined by what you're doing now. So I think it's accepting that you're on the journey, um, loving the steps that you're taking rather than focusing on, on the destination. Uh, and as you said, it, it, it's not easy. It's not built in a day. Um, it's a journey. Um, but it it starts with, it all starts and ends with love. Mm. So Perfection is, it's an illusion, really. It's not really a tangible goal, I, I, would, I would posit. And, you know, think about anyone that you love. <laughs> if you can say that they're perfect, then I'd love to meet that person. <laughs> they sound like a good person to know. So if you can apply that same principle of all of the other things that I love aren't perfect, why can't I love myself? Also a flawed individual, a flawed human being. You know, I think that's all the perspective that you really need there. Um, so yeah, ground yourself in your self-love and unlock your own personal selfie flower. And you might have different words that you use to define your selfie flower. You might find that some of those words didn't relate to you. Find your own words. There are many words that follow self. Add your selfie <laughs> words in the comments. If there's any that we've left out or any that you'd like to add, there's definitely a few others that we, we, we thought of, but because of time, we didn't discuss. So yeah, it'd be great to hear about your selfie words and maybe we can create a, a, a big old selfie, selfie flower. Um, 
And before it gets too mushy and, and, and too, <laughs> too loved up, uh, I think it's a, a great caveat to move on to our next value, which is technical excellence. And it does, t- I think it ties in with self, especially self-development, um, but we thought we'd cover it more as the, the technical excellence aspect of things. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think this is a good time. I think I was I was getting a little bit deep there. So mm. thank you for uh, for for bringing us back in line. There's nothing wrong. There's with nothing that. wrong with getting a little bit deep. So. We thought we'd be talking about love in episode two of Steminism, the Equity and Stem podcast. But yeah, we. we I go would with hope the flow. that I'd hope that you'd need love to to try and instill equity. You know, true. true so um, true. okay, technical excellence. So you know, there's a lot of things we could talk about, but let's start simple. What what does technical excellence mean to you? I, I love that question because I don't think it's a, a straightforward answer. You know, in exams, you get explain ABC for four marks. Yeah, this feels like it would be a really detailed one. I think my answer has kind of changed with time. But what really encapsulates it is an expression that I think we're all very familiar with. And it's jack of all trades, master of none. And when you initially hear this expression or when I was familiar with it, it kind of emphasized that you're, you you can do a little bit of here and there, but nothing in general. Uh, so it wasn't until I found out the full expression, which is jack of all trades, master of none, is oftentimes better than a master of one. Firstly, I was like, wow, what, what does... <laughs> Some deep, I need to, need to bring that back. Yeah, Break that down just, line by line. Exactly. <laughs> and so maybe let me just run it back. Jack of all trades, master of none, is oftentimes better than a master of one. And so what I took from this after years of deliberation and Google searches was that actually you can be an expert in a field where, for example, if it's HPLC liquid chromatography, you can decide that you're going to be the expert in this. You're going to know all the columns, all the dilutions, all the different... If there's a question, you can answer it. And that's your box. It may take you 30 years, 20 years to get to that level. But if we go... If if there's something that happens in HPLC and we need to find something out, we're going to go to Ali because Ali's the expert in HPLC. I am actually, just for the record. (laughs) Not just note-making, not just note-making for for the record. (laughs) And so even aside from that, it, that that was what I thought was kind of the old school train of thought where you become an expert, you go to university, you study it, you get a job in it, you sit in the lab in it, you do it, and then you become the best at it. When actually, as I unfolded kind of the why the thought of this expression, being a jack of all trades, even when you think about the cards, usually the jack isn't as good as the queen or the king or the ace, but it's... A, it's Pretty good card. In blackjack, it holds the same weight. If you've got a jack, it's pretty good. And so rather than being the ace in spectroscopy, you can be the jack in all the different suits. So you wear different hats. You're not just an expert in spectroscopy. You're an expert in present in presenting different um presenting different formats. So whether it's PowerPoints, whether it's public speaking, whether it's talking about the raw data, uh, data analysis is another really important one. You may be great at getting data, but if you can't into, in, into get into the real detail of it to understand it, what's the value? So being a master of all the trades or the jack of all trades is what I find to be really valuable. And once you get to, rather than getting to 99% of expertise, if you get to 70 65, move on to the next one. It's better to have five skills that you're 65 um, efficient in than one that you're 99% in. And it depends on the role, depends on the industry, but I feel it's always, it's easier to add breadth than it is to add depth once you get to a certain level. Yeah, I think you you hit the nail on the head. Um, I fully relate to all of that. Um, I guess I want to maybe offer a slightly different perspectives. I think I would identify more so with the jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, Initial, yeah. What's the uh, second bit? Jack of all trades, master of none, oftentimes better than a master master of of one. one. That's it. So yeah, I definitely don't like it without the last sentence on the end there. Um, But for example, right now I'm employed as a consultant chemist and my clients want me to be very tight as an expert in a very small subset, fuels, petroleum, cargoes, solids, uh, you know, 
thing, thing, th- things that require chemistry knowledge, but very specifically to the marine industry. If I have knowledge of, you know, presentation skills or project management or, um, yeah, many, many different aspects which are usually beneficial to a company, to them it doesn't mean anything. There's n- absolutely no value added to them because they just need me when they need to answer a specific subset of questions. So there is definitely a benefit to um, to being a technical expert in that regard. And uh, I, I, I sort of had a thought there where I had a mentoring session once with um, with a guy who'd set up his own consultancy company and he was sort of getting towards retiring now and he was trying to pass on some of those skills. And my question for him was, should I do a PhD or should, should I do an MBA, right? Very good question. Depends which route you're trying to take. And he said to me, people care a lot more about the letters in front of your name than the letters after your name. So Jeez. In this case, <laughs> run that back, run that back, run that back. Give some context as well. So people give, care more about the letters at the front of your name than at the back of your name. So mm. at the front of your name, you're going to have something like doctor, probably. Or if you went to sea or you are a pilot, you might have captain there or something, which distinguishes you. You're, you know, my dad used to be a, a, a captain at sea and he's still referred to as Captain Faisal. Put Man some respect. respect before the name, exactly. if, you know, if you know what I mean. Afterwards, you have, you know, MSC, uh, you have your charter ships, which are great, don't get me wrong, and we should probably still all thrive, uh, to, sorry, still strive to, um, to get those achievements, but it is um, completely dependent on your role and the required skill set by that role. Um, same time, when I worked for a previous employer, I was, I was still working as a technical consultant and I worked in a very specific field. But because my company had people from so many different backgrounds, there was actually a benefit to having some other skills in someone else's area because um, you know your boss might come to you with uh, an inquiry which wouldn't usually fit your regular remit that you were employed for. But because you saw it once or you, you you ran across it once, suddenly you're the person, you know, you're the person that that they're interested in talking to about this thing. So I think it's complex, ultimately. I don't think there's a there's a one size fits all answer of it's better to be multi-skilled or it's better to be a technical expert. It depends on you as an individual. It depends on the role that you're needed for. And um, yeah, it also depends how you want to market yourself because I know people who like to market themselves as experts. They want to be written about in magazines. You know, they want to be the figurehead in their industry. And I know people who are that, but are silent. Powerful, powerful. Just adding to that, so whether you're an expert, whether you're a, a, a master of all trades, what do you think the importance of, of technical excellence is? And especially in our industry, why do you think why why do you think we made it one of our values? What do you see that makes it so key? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, let's start at the beginning. Employability. Um, usually speaking, uh, in a STEM role, uh, and I'm not trying to be biased here in any way, a, a lot of roles in STEM require technical skills, either from a scientific, technological, mathematical, or engineering perspective. Um, So an employer is really not going to even look at you unless you've been able to demonstrate that you have some technical background, whether that's a degree or an apprenticeship or um, uh, an internship that you did at a company um, to the point where if you're looking to be employed as a technical consultant, 10 to 15 years established excellence working in a specific area. So employability is, I think, one of the the key reasons why technical excellence is is really important in STEM specifically. Um, Maybe another reason is, I sort of touched on it earlier, but it's to do with your brand um, and how you market yourself. Um, I think it can be quite a powerful tool to market yourself um, as a technical expert. Um, and to demonstrate technical excellence, um, people will value value you or respect you in a certain way. Um, and it's a shame, really, because I think at the core of that is our understanding of intelligence. You know, we have a very narrow um, 
in general, a narrow understanding of what intelligence means. You know, usually when people think, I tell people I'm a, I'm a scientist and they're like, oh, you're, you must be really smart, you know. But I'm like, I'm sure you're really smart too, but you just chose a different area to, to go down. So I think there's maybe a bias towards being book smart in maths or science or engineering because to people who never walked that path, it's just so inaccessible. But um, in reality, there are many, many different kinds of intelligence. And I think this is the first thing I say to people usually when they say to me, oh, you must be really smart. I'm like, well, I'm sure you're smart in ways that I couldn't even begin to fathom. Um, so yeah, I guess those are the first two things that came to my head. Um, I wondered if you had anything that you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I'd just, I'd just like to add to that wisdom as well. I think one of the points that you touched on in terms of employability is definitely one that we can we can relate to. I think in the previous episode, you admitted that you got a third class degree. Uh, myself, second, lower. When we were applying for jobs, it was tough. You, you realize that this is the yardstick that you're measured against. When the job descriptions are written, there's the required mm. um, attributes or skills. And usually, second class degree or above is required. So straight away, you set yourself at a disadvantage without that. Not to mean that there's nothing you can do to, to improve your technical excellence, but that's often the yardstick. So in the very fundamentals, in a very highly competitive job market, the difference between a first, two, one, two, two, third, can often be the things that will determine whether you get an interview or not. So not to be underestimated, but there are other ways to, to improve your, your technical excellence, whether it's through in-job experience, secondments, mentoring, um, work shadowing, um, also professional courses um, as part of your process de or your professional development. You can do a course on project management, on public speaking, could be on Excel, how to become an expert in Excel, which is oh, I'm really, doing that right now. <laughs> such an underrated skill. Really I is. remember when we were in university, I used to hate the Excel classes because I used to think these numbers don't mean anything. But one of the things I realized really early on in my role is that if I'm able to master data management, data entry, and I can do it, it can save so much time. And I can add value to other people who aren't as good. One of the best examples was my boss. He used to hate putting the, the, the data from the, 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 the lab data into a kind of lab notebook data that did the processing and it was literally one number he'd type it in so if you've got 100 results that's 100 entries when I Oof. showed him the control all scroll and you can do a sequence he wanted to give me a promotion <laughs> straight away and it was just and that's when the penny dropped that wow actually all these little things add up and so it's not just a degree it's, it's other parts other ways that you can add to it as well um, that are really important um, and I think how how IQ is, is measured as well is such an underrated, and, and you see it across the generations, especially in in people of of black and Af African descent. People in further generations are now finding out, oh, they may have been aut autistic, or they may have had ADHD. And back in the day, they were just sent to to the the. Exactly, exactly. Without actually interrogating, finding out why. And so that also leads to a lack of neurodiversity as well, which we're now seeing is, is, is really important. How many of these CEOs, the world's leading companies, do you find out, oh, actually, they were autistic or they had this that they, they dealt with and found a way to, to overcome? So, Steve Jobs. Something. Jobs, I right, think, right. uh, I think um, Jeff Bezos um, yeah. has, has come out as well. And... and some others don't as well. And some you can actually see the traits in them as well. But they've almost turned those, those what are looked at as sometimes syndromes or mental illnesses, and they've turned them into superpowers. And, and so it's almost taken that rejection and turning it into a redirection, which I think is, is really important. So if we're all measuring how smart we are by how we climb, by how different animals climb a tree... The fish is always going to be stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, but if, if you're in a sticky situation and you need to swim out, the, the fish's perspective is going to be key. That's so I think oftentimes we're measuring everyone as to how fast they can climb a tree, only to find out that they're cutting down all the trees. Mm -hmm. 
That, that, that's a story. For, that's a whole story for, for another day. Oh my gosh, um, that was this guy is the king of quotables. I just want to <laughs> just want to state it now and make sure that's that's nice and clear. But yeah, I think that was a, a really really good perspective. And actually, you know, we're trying to address this issue of diversity in the workplace. So if we are just gauging people on traditional aspects of technical excellence, a we're not going to have the best workforce. Or um, or um, academic, is it a workforce also? Academic workforce. B, um, our companies are not going to be maximizing their profitability, which is actually really why they were formed in the first place. Um, and C, there's just going to be large groups of people who are excluded, unfortunately, from society and from the professional world, which you know, which is a, a, a tragedy, if not anything else. Um, so yeah, I think that was a really, really important and, and, and powerful point that you just touched on there. Um, so we're, we're drawing close. Um, I think I'd like to maybe just wrap up talking about bringing you back home. So as Vanta STEM, uh, our message is really targeted at, um, minoritized identities, um, people like us, people who look like us, um, how do you feel like these values that we've just touched on the self and technical excellence, how do you feel like um, people from our sort of backgrounds, um, what are the challenges um, that, that those sort of people face when considering values of self and technical excellence? I don't know if you want to take self and maybe I'll take technical excellence. Yeah, um, I think we'll probably merge into a bit yeah. of both. But I think just starting off, it's hard to be what you can't see and... I've heard this from, from many wise gurus and, and leaders in, in the field. And a great example of this is, when, especially when we were growing up, if you asked any young black kid, who do you want to be in future? Most likely it would be an Ian Wright or a Michael Jordan it, or, or a musician. It would either be a musician or an entertainment or sports because that's where the epitome of, of black culture had led. When you looked at the celebrities, even now, when you look at the billionaires, your Jay-Zs, your... Um, LeBron Jameses. LeBron Jameses, exactly. That in sports and entertainment. When I found out about Lonnie Johnson, mm. and now if you haven't heard about Lonnie Johnson, not only was he a, a renowned NASA scientist, he's also the inventor of the super soaker and all the Nerf guns. So if you've ever had some great summers <laughs> with, with, the, with, with, a, with a super soaker or a Nerf gun... That's Do they still to, make those even? They, <laughs> trust me, trust me, the kids are... I've, they, they've upgraded them. Now you can get like bazooka size Super Nerf rocket launcher. With, exactly. <laughs> and, and it all came from, from a black man. So when I found out about Lonnie, straight away I knew that actually what maybe my glass ceilings and my self-limitations. Actually, if, if Lonnie can do it and you hear about his career path and the trials and tribulations, it encourages. So seeing is believing. And that's why also in, in football now, when you look at the, the England national team, majority of them are young black boys because they saw it, they believed it, and now they're achieving it. So well that, is, that is really important and, and not to be underestimated. So... As I said, Lonnie Johnson is a, is a is a great example. John Edmondston is another great I mean, example. There are so many. So many. We've under, done we've underrated. done talks about this. We've given many many presentations about the number of unrepresented or um, you know people who weren't paid their flowers who have gone on to do amazing, incredible things in the realm of STEM. Um, so yeah, what I was hearing there was essentially uh, there aren't enough role models. So how can we be change makers today? How can we be those role models for people in 20 years' time who are looking to enter into the field? That's a really good one. I like that a lot. Um, what about technical excellence? Technical excellence, I think the challenge is here, as you see, um, even by the recent study published by the Royal Society of um, Chemistry, uh, the Missing Elements Report, which is a really great report that you should read if you get the chance. You um, can probably add a link below as well. And this talks about the challenges and the access um, to education for um, ethnic minorities. And so I think at the time of the report, there was just one black chemistry professor on record. I think when they did the calculations, it was actually less than 1%. 0%. So technically, due to statistics, he didn't exist. And so that highlighted a number of problems. Is there just one black chemistry 
teacher? If so, that is a problem. Number two, are there more out there that maybe aren't declaring or, or aren't aware of the studies? But either way, it's under underrepresentation. And so if I am aspiring to be the next best or, or a professor in chemistry, it's going to be very hard to, to find him, to, for him to mentor me, show the trials and tribulations. And so I think that, again, it kind of ties in with what I said about self as well. And so I think those are the challenges. Um, and also culturally, environments, growing up, the accessibility is, is really key. And that ties in with, you, with, with self as well. It's as, as powerful as the self can be, depending on the environment you're, you're, you're brought up in, there's going to be, there. they may enforce limitations as well. Mm, yeah, that, so, was, that was really good. Yeah. I think it was, uh, was it George the Poet that I was thinking of who, um, you know, grew up in, a, uh, in, in an environment, fortunately, which was, which was good. And he was book smart and more inclined towards wanting to study and learn and write. But the area that he grew up was pretty rough. And a lot of his friends, a lot of his peers, um, you know, didn't really go down that path. So there is an aspect of what cards you were dealt might limit your limit, your your your, your possibilities for technical excellence. But there is a, a self aspect, as you mentioned, that plays into that. Um, how can you turn your circumstances around such that you're able to exploit your position and actually use that because i guess in those environments they'll really really notice the one two three four people who stick out so um yeah and and this is really a big reason why we're involved in this work is the fact that those challenges are not just perceived challenges for minoritized identities they're very real challenges um so we're doing whatever we can to really really approach that and address that so I think that actually brings us to the conclusion. Um, I really, really enjoyed that. That was a really, really great talk. Um, next week, we're going to touch on um, some of our other values, which are, um, oh, what we got? Equity. Equity, the core, the core value, very, very important. And uh, mindset, which is, I think, the thing that, that turned everything around for us, how to unlock your mindset. So I won't say too much about that now. Uh, any closing remarks from your side? Anything that you want to add? Yeah, um, I think this has been a, a, a great episode. It's great to to hear your thoughts. The time has actually flown by as well. Um, what we'd love you to do is is leave your thoughts in the comments. We're we're trying to build a community, um, and we would love to hear from you as well. So if you've got any thoughts about anything we can add to the selfie flower, or or any ways that you've improved your technical excellence, or if you just think actually. Forget the jack of all trades. You want to be the, the master of one. It would be great to hear that as well. So reach out to us, connect. And in the meantime, can we can we make that announcement yet? You know, I think let's it, go ahead. Mm, I think let's go ahead. Yeah, wait, everything's me, been approved. You, I, sure? I looked on Did the website. I looked on the website, and it's been published on the website. So you don't want to wait. So, to, all right. So, I think we should wait to the next. Oh, one. teasers, teasers. Not, not teasing, but I <laughs> I am just thinking now, in the spirit of of equity and doing okay. things right. Okay, all right. Maybe we just, we just yeah, sign off. Time. And it gives you guys another reason to come back for the last the episode, next episode. Of, this, of this prequel as Trust well. Trust me, you, you want to you wanna hear about this news. It's pretty deep and it's really, really cool. We're so glad uh, about this thing that we've, that we've managed to secure. So um, yeah, tune in next time. Until then. We've, I've been Clive. I've been Ali. We've We're Ventus STEM. STEM. Stay blessed. Cool.